Thank you so much, and thank you, Pastor Norm, for that over-the-top introduction. Uh, God bless Pastor Norm and Dina. Uh, we're so glad. I can speak for my family, uh, Hillary, uh, myself, that uh, we are so honored to call East Coast Believers Church our home. And uh, tonight is my privilege to come and speak and share in this evening. So let's just do it. How about that? <laughs> All right. So I'm set up with the touch the touchless screen, the touch screen, right? And uh, I feel like I have access to the Holy Grail. <laughs> and I'm, I'm almost afraid to use it because I don't want to break it. <laughs> but uh, so, so I feel very honored. But when I speak, I really like to use visuals. And, and I'm a very visual learner, and I, I like to communicate visually. So tonight, I want to speak to you from, let's see if this works, the Song of Solomon. Now, for the Bible lovers tonight, I want to share my heart. This is what I do. I love to teach the Word of God. And I want to talk to you tonight from the book of Song of Solomon. Now, if you're new to Scripture, if you're new to uh, the Old Testament especially, when you come to the Song of Solomon, you may get to that book and you may say, what on earth is this doing in the Bible? How did it ever get here? And it, it reads a bit like Shakespeare. When you read the Song of Solomon, what you're reading is Solomon and his love for a Shulamite girl and her love back toward him. And so it is, it is a song, and so it's written very poetically, and it's absolutely beautiful. As a matter of fact, just as a literary work, it would stand on its own as a masterpiece. Shakespeare couldn't write like this on his best day because this is anointed. So let me, let me take you into the Song of Solomon. What do you need to know? A couple of things here. First of all, God is not mentioned in the Song of Solomon. You will not find his name. You will not find a reference to Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai. It's just not in there. But what I, what I would suggest to you this evening is though you will not find God in the Song of Solomon, you will find God all over the Song of Solomon. He is on the book, he is in the book, but he's not mentioned in the book. And so the the picture that's portrayed here is very unique. There is no linear storyline either. When you read a story in the West like you and I, we expect there to be a beginning, we expect there to be a middle, we expect there to be an ending, but the Song of Solomon's not designed like this. It's, it's, it's Hebraic poetry, and it's got a very Eastern flavor to it. So it would be like this. When you look through the book, it, you're trying to figure it out, and it would be as though you took several pictures of your life, maybe photographs, and you just plopped them on the table and said, that's my life. And then I would say, I, I need some help learning about your life. And what you would do is you would, you would take uh, the pictures, and you would pull them out, and you'd try to give me an order. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you some framework to kind of hang the Song of Solomon on. The, the other thing is about the Song of Solomon that you need to know is that the Hebrew scholars and rabbis for thousands of years have referred to this book as the Holy of Holies. It was sacred to them. Um, it, 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 it meant something to them because when they read the Song of Solomon, they did not just read a book about physical love or romantic infatuation. They read the book in light of how God loves his people so deeply and so emphatically. Um, they were moved by this. As a matter of fact, every year, for thousands of years now, the Song of Solomon is read during the Passover feast. And you say, why would the Song of Solomon be read during the Passover feast? Well, because when Israel was redeemed out of Egypt, 
And they were brought to Mount Sinai and they received the law of God in their mind and in God's mind. That was the day that Israel was married to Jehovah God. It, it, that was the day that was the day when Israel became the wife of Jehovah. And that analogy is just played out through Scripture, especially in the, in the prophets when you read Hosea and Jeremiah and other prophets. It's, it's very clear in there. And so God says, I love you, Israel. I love my people like a husband, like a faithful husband loves his wife. He says, I only have two things to ask of you. Be faithful and love me back. And throughout the prophets, Israel would sway and they would try to bring Israel back to God, but that analogy was very fixed in their minds. So they read this book every year and they're reminded of God's faithful love, God's unrelenting love, God's pursuant love of his people in every way. And then in the New Testament, we see the analogy as well, right? We see Christ as the bridegroom. We see the church as the bride. And, and God, God so established that principle in the heart of his people that the analogy is actually flipped. What do you mean by that? In the Old Testament, God says to Israel, I love you like a husband loves his wife. In the New Testament, that is an established fact, and so now the analogy is flipped, and the Lord says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, so the, the, the analogy is established. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful work of literature. It is the inspired word of God, and it, it teaches us about how much God loves us. Now, let me say this, that there's a bit of controversy on how to understand this book. You see tonight I'm doing a little bit of teaching before we go somewhere. So I'm laying a foundation. But if you, if you were to study out the Song of Solomon, you would find some people that just get bent on the human reality it's a man, it's a woman, it's marital love, and, and that's where they stay. And then the other side of that spectrum would be, of course, uh, the divine experience. And there are those who see the analogy like we've been talking about a little bit tonight. But, but it seems like there's this controversy and there's this, there's this division of the two camps. And I would say this, I would suggest tonight that the two are not mutually exclusive, that the human experience and the divine experience can rest together. The natural and the spiritual can sit well together. You might say it's a place where the psychology and the theology find a meeting place because man has a need. We are human beings, right? We, uh, we, we, we are physical. We are in the carnal flesh. And so when God speaks of marriage and when he speaks of relationship between a man and a woman from the book of the Song of Solomon, Solomon, yes, he does have a lot to say about it. And yes, it is inspired. But ultimately, the analogy is what is the greater truth because it demonstrates the passionate, dynamic love that God has for his people. So let me say this. I want to go on the human side just for a moment. There is, within the Song of Solomon, the identification of authentic connection between two people. You are hardwired to be connected to others. You are not designed for isolation. You are not designed for um, being secluded. You are not designed to be alone. We need community. We need each other. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Us is important. And, and so... Um, so much has been studied in our day about human connection, actually um, loneliness, the study of the important of, importance of human touch. For example, according to sociologists, we know that, that, that loneliness is one of the great 
predictors of early death. It's also a predictor of um, dementia. It's a predictor of, of uh, anxiety and depression. Seclusion doesn't work for us. It, it doesn't work at all. So, um, authentic connection. But again, it speaks to us of this need for the intimacy that we can find in God because there's an invitation there. So when I come to this, I need to drop you to the Song of Solomon. What we're going to do is we're just going to look at the book for a little bit. So we're going to get into the scripture. Enough with the introduction. Solomon, in Song of Solomon 8 and verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand silver coins. So, Baal Haman, now remember, everything in this book is symbolic, it's allegory, um, it's got rich meaning behind it, and when you start studying it from the perspective that this is how God loves us, it really begins to come alive for you. For example, Baal Haman. This verse describes kind of like... Here, here are the families that they're letting out this farm. It would be like sharecropping in the Old West. And they would, they would work this farm, and they would have a family. And sure enough, Solomon had this vineyard, and it's called Baal Haman. Baal Haman means abundance and continual, intense communion. This is the place where the story begins. Now, this story is kind of interesting. The story is that there is this family. They're working this, this vineyard for Solomon. We don't know much about this family, but apparently the father had gone away. Maybe he died. We're not sure really what happened to the father, but he's not there. He's not in the picture. And there is a mother and her sons and, her, and the daughter. And, and the daughter is kind of like a Cinderella. She's abused, she's mistreated, she's misunderstood. They put her out in the, the vineyards and they, they make her labor. And as the story progresses, you have Solomon. Now, Solomon is one of the great kings of Israel and under his, under his leadership, Israel expanded in wealth and extravagance. And Solomon is going to check out these vineyards. He's going to lay aside his kingly robe. He's going to lay aside his scepter and his, uh, his chariot and his soldiers and his entourage and his singers and his dancers. He's going to set that aside and he's going to saddle up his horse and he's going to ride down to the vineyard and bail Haman. He's going to uh, commence to just, he's kind of like the first undercover boss, if you mind. And so he's going to check out his vineyard. He goes down to the vineyard and he finds this Shulamite girl and he is smitten by her. He is just overtaken by her, and, and he begins to woo her, and he begins to uh, talk to her, and he begins to say, you, you are the fairest of 10,000. There's nobody like you. You are special. You, and he's just wild. Now, she, on the other hand, is not really ready to accept all of that. She, she says, what about the daughters of Jerusalem? They're much fairer than me. And who am I? I I'm, I'm in the vineyards all day long. I'm working so hard. My skin is burnt by the sun. I've been mistreated. No one really. I, I've taken care of other vineyards, but my own vineyard, I've just kind of let go. And so there's just nothing there. And so she kind of pushes away his love. But Solomon really loves her. And he pursues her, and he draws her, and he woos her. And eventually, she 
succumbs to that. Here comes this guy. He's tall. He's handsome. He's good looking. He's all this stuff. He gets off his horse. He's talking like Shakespeare. And they fall in love. And so what you have in the Song of Solomon, you have this beautiful poetic book. And Solomon is describing his love for her. And she's describing her love back toward him. And then the story progresses like all love stories do. And there's generally a turn, right? In most love stories. So what happens, he comes to her one day and he says, I got to go. I got to go back. I got to go away. Now, she doesn't realize that he's the king. All she knows is this is some handsome shepherd. And she says, you know, you're a kind of a funny shepherd because you don't seem to have any sheep. And you just kind of come in here and you're this and that. And, and the other shoe drops, right? And, 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 and he says, I've got to go. But, but wait, I'm going to come back and we'll be together and we'll be together forever. And she's probably thinking, well, you know, I've heard that before. And so Solomon rides off and she, she, she waits for him and Days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and she waits and she longs for him and she can't get him out of her mind. She's lovesick. And um, a long time passes by and what happens is the daughters of Jerusalem say, why are you waiting out for him? What does he have that some others don't have? And then all of a sudden, what happens? One day, out of nowhere, over the hills, come this large, uh, big uh, entourage from, from Jerusalem and from the king's palace. And there are soldiers and there are swords and there's all of these things. And there's dancers and, and there's, there's the king. He's coming to Baal Haman and he comes down and, 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 and everybody's all excited And they come right down into the village, right down by her cottage. They knock on her door. They bring her out. And they say, you are summoned to meet the king. And she looks up and she realizes that the shepherd that she had fallen in love with is in actuality the king of all Jerusalem. So it's kind of a wonderful Cinderella type story. But that's your story. And that's my story too. Because there was a day in my life, and there's a day in your life, no doubt, when we were laboring life under the sun. And maybe you didn't feel well-respected. Maybe you felt mistreated. Maybe you felt underutilized by others or overlooked. And sure enough, one day in your life came this shepherd And he began to speak love to your heart and he began to woo you and he began to draw you unto himself. And one day you found his love irresistible. You couldn't deny your feelings for him. You had to be with this one called called Jesus. And then one day as time goes on and you develop this walk in the Lord, you realize that the shepherd you fell in love with is king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming again, and the wait won't be long. And so this is, kind of, this is kind of the backdrop of this story. Now, when you go into this book and these two fall in love, by the way, when Solomon sees this girl and he can't get her out of his mind, what you want to think about in these verses is this is the way that Jesus loves me. This is the way Jesus thinks of me. He says, you are altogether beautiful. My darling, there is no flaw in you. You may be down on yourself and you may see your burnt skin and you may see your condition and your circumstances. You may see your history, but he sees your destiny. And, and, and so this, this, this king, he's speaking to our heart. And so this is the way, this is the way he loves you. As a matter of fact, let me give you an interesting insight on this. Solomon Shulamite, her name's not mentioned. Solomon kind of sounds like shalom. It's the same root word, means peace. 
Solomon Shulamite is the same word. It's the feminine and the male uh, gender pronunciation and an explanation of the same word. In Hebrew, you have uh, feminine and gen- uh, you have gender associations with names and words, and that's what you have in there, and they both mean peace. And so the two come together, and they form perfect peace. And in your life, when you trusted Jesus, and when you, when you fell in love with Jesus, there was perfect peace. As a matter of fact, when you look at this, this, this male and female gender representations of the same name, let me just give you another thought. When God created Adam, he, he took a rib out because why? It wasn't good for man to be alone. Now the Hebrews, the Hebrew scholars and the rabbis, they didn't believe or they didn't see that God just did a little incision and took a little rib out and made woman, they literally believed that God split Adam in half and the feminine was extracted from the male. And so when a man and a woman come together, the man can truly say, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The two complete each other. Now that whole idea from pop psychology, you complete me, that's where it came from. And so, so your ladies, you're more than just a McRib, okay? You're, <laughs> you're the half of the whole, and when God puts you together, there is perfect peace, and it represents your relationship in Christ. As a matter of fact, that relationship is so profound that not only is the Holy Spirit in you, but you are in Christ, and Christ is seated in the heavenlies. The two halves are there, and yet we are here, and we are in the heavenlies, blessed with all spiritual blessings at the same time. That is the unity of Christ. For that reason, the Christian life is not an experience of just imitation. The Christian life is a participation. The Christian life is an incarnation. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the blessing of this. The two come together, perfect peace. There are three scenes. It's like watching a play. It's like a movie. The first scene is this. All right. We'll get there. (laughs) Norm, I didn't break it. (laughs) I'll blame somebody else. Um, The first scene is the vineyard. We've talked a little bit about this. This is where the shepherd comes and he, he sees this maiden. He calls her. The relationship begins. Let me get going that way. All right, here we go. And he says to her, come away with me. Think about that. This is a girl that doesn't think very highly of herself. This is a girl that's kind of down on herself. This is a girl that's been mistreated. She's got some baggage. And he says, come away with me. Come away from that which is familiar. Come away from that which is comfortable. The vineyard is this place of discovery. It's this place of awakening. It's this place of arousal. As a matter of fact, I love one of the verses in chapter 8 where, where, where Solomon says about the Shulamite and her love. He said, I woke you up under the apple tree. Isn't that interesting? Apples. Do you know what apples symbolize in the word of God? They symbolize the promises of God. A word fitly spoken is as apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Silver always represents redemption. Gold always represents deity. Here, the promises of God rest between redemption and deity. He wakes her up under the apple tree. You and I were woken up under the tree of promise too. It's the tree of Calvary. As a matter of fact, the apples are all throughout the Song of Solomon. He, when he describes her, one of the things that he describes is he describes her breath. And he says, your breath is like apples. Why does she have apples breath? 
because she's been eating apples. She doesn't have Dorito breath. (laughs) She has apple breath. The bride loves the promises of God. The bride is nourished by the promises of God. The the bride is sustained by the promises of God. That's just good preaching. And in this vineyard, he says, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is gone over, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. This is her breakthrough. This is her deliverance. The winter, the harshness, the rain, it's over, it's gone. And the flowers now are appearing, and for the first time, maybe in a long time or maybe forever, she hears the dove. The dove speaks of Holy Spirit. She wakes up. She has this new awareness. She's had this breakthrough now from difficulty to adversity to peace. The flowers are blooming. There's new life. And she now hears the voice of the Spirit of God in her life. I can relate to that. But there's a different experience. There's a new experience. There's a deeper experience. There's an experience yet to come. He takes her to the garden. Everybody's invited to the garden. Everybody's welcome to come to the garden. But the garden, the garden, unfortunately, not everybody enters into the garden. He describes in chapter four this beautiful garden. It's, 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 it's a paradise. It's filled with lush fruits. It's filled with a river that flows down from Lebanon. The garden is plush. It's this beautiful paradise. And he invites her to come to this garden. And the garden is representative of our deeper experience in in Christ. He says, my sister, my bride, you are a garden. And it's interesting because he flips the analogy. You know, he says, I invite you to this garden. And here's what you can have. But you're kind of like a garden, but you're a locked up garden. You're in a closed spring. You're a fountain that's sealed. Because remember, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hesitation on her part. And she accepts his love slowly. And she's hesitant. She's kind of closed up and she's kind of sealed off. And she's, she's kind of reserved about this. And he says to go into this deeper level of experience in the spirit-filled life, you have to get out of yourself You have to drop the barriers. You have to release the ego. You have to get out of your head and get out of yourself. One writer of years gone by, he said it like this, you have to divest the soul of all of its false wrappings. We don't write like that anymore, but I love that phrase. We're all wrapped up in self and insecurities in ego, in all of this stuff. We wonder who's watching and what people will think. And, and he says, you're like a garden. You're kind of locked up and sealed up. You've got to break that barrier. So what he does, he begins to describe this garden. And he says, you are a fountain of gardens. A well of living water springs up within you. Now, that kind of sounds familiar, right? A well of living water is springing up within you like a mountain brook flowing into my heart. And so as the, as the garden is described, and as the garden is elaborated on, it's beautiful. Here you have Lebanon, the mountains, and the river flows, and it's living water because the water is flowing. This is not describing a lake. It's describing a, 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 a living water. And, of course, we know Jesus said that he that believes out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the waters flow. And he describes in chapter 4, in verse 13 through 14, nine fruits. Get the picture with me. The water is flowing. It's living water. It comes into this plush garden experience, and now nine fruits are identified. 
And of course, we know that the water, the living waters, are speaking of the Holy Spirit. And there are nine fruits of the Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. And that's the experience for the child of God in the garden. We meet him and we fall in love with him in the vineyard. But yet there is more. There is more to be had. There is more to be known. There is a deeper experience with him as the Spirit of God flows through our life, produces the fruit, and the end result is this. He comes to the garden and he partakes of the fruit. Ha! He eats of the fruit from the garden. And so in many ways, that is a beautiful, beautiful picture of not only our lives individually, but our lives as a church, as we come together in community, because here is where the fruit is growing. And as the water of the Spirit trickles down and nourishes this garden, the Lord Jesus himself, King of kings, comes and partakes of his fruit. It's beautiful. So there is the vineyard, Deeper yet, she can go to the garden, and deeper yet, uh oh, Norm, we're having problems. Oh, there's the chamber. That's even a deeper experience. Now, I had mentioned that this is very much the Holy of Holies. Think about this with me. You have the outer court, the holy place. Behind the veil, the high priest would come and he would go into the chamber. It's a smoke-filled chamber. It's where the presence of God is. It's yet the deepest experience. And one of the things that, that I love about this is her desire. She says, draw me. We come to the Lord, how? Because we're drawn of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Sometimes I can't get there on my own. Sometimes my enthusiasm is not enough, and I need to say, Lord, draw me. She says, draw me. The result of that is he brings her into the chamber. There the relationship becomes very personal. There the relationship becomes very private. There the relationship becomes very intimate. But there's a dream sequence in this book. Every great movie has a dream sequence. Norm must have the magic touch. Mm. Let me tell you about the dream sequence. Mm She dreams that she sees her love. He comes to the door. It's the spirit. (laughs) She's awakened in the middle of the night. He's at the door. He's knocking. She sees him through the, the latch key hole. Her heart is moved and she says, I've just gotten ready for bed. I've taken off my stuff. I'm not ready to get up. And she delays her response and She runs to the door and she can't find him. He's gone. She smells his scent. She runs out into the street. She is abused by the watchman. She finally finds him. She grabs him and she says, I will not let you go. There needs to be within our heart in this place a desperation for God. So we're not talking about an academic understanding. We're not talking about an intellectual acceptance. We're not talking about religious activity. We're talking about a deep, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus that is experienced by every believer in the Spirit of God as we go from vineyard to garden to the chamber. I'm coming to the garden, my sister, my spouse. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with honey. Drink. Drink abundantly. 
That is the invitation that Jesus gives us to drink deeply, to drink without hesitation, to drink without reserve, to drink abundantly, not just a sip and you have to pass and go. Drink abundantly. Would you pray with me tonight? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father God, I thank you for the experience that is every believer's privilege. It's our right by birth to know you intimately, privately, deeply and passionately. Father, many tonight on a Wednesday night have no doubt met you in the vineyard. Others may be seeking you in the garden. May you drop the barriers. Let go of the things that are sealing you up, walling you off, limiting your experience. He says, drink abundantly. There's a chamber experience yet to be had. He loves you so much. He loves you deeply. He loves you passionately. We get so hung up of where we've been and what we've gone through and all the things we're trying to fix in life. And he says, I find no fault in you. You're the only one of your mother. He says, he says, your love is better than wine. It's the best thing. Christ wants you so very much. He wants to love you so passionately. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I just ask for a lifted hand. Say, pray for me, Tim. I want that deeper experience. I want to enter in. I've got stuff I'm trying to let go. I've got stuff that's holding me back. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Father, I pray that you'd bless your people tonight. Thank you for the scripture. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the experience that's ours to be had. In Jesus' name we